What has been so fascinating to me in just researching fasting and watching the application of it is that I don't know why it's taken us till 2023 to realize that we have two metabolisms. And one of them we activate when we eat and one of them we activate when we don't eat. And it's just like a hybrid car. You know, you've got the electrical piece and you have the gas piece and, and our human body is like that. Think about this, like we have been debating nutrition and what's the best diet for the human. It's taken us till this moment to go, there's another metabolism we need to pay attention to. We can't just focus in on nutrition. We have to be able to switch between sugar burner, fat burner, just like a hybrid car. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because I need it. I need it for me because I don't wake up every day and say, yes, let's go conquer the world. Now I wake up and, and I need that external motivation to match my internal motivation. When I see somebody who's doing amazing things, it makes me just want to play a bigger game. And so I hope that today's video makes you want to play a bigger game too, because your message matters and let's get it out to the world. So today this one from one of the best, Dr. Mindy, and my take on her top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. You have to go about eight hours without food for your body to make this switch. So when we eat, you know, we know our blood sugar goes up, glucose will go up, and then glucose starts to come down. And eight hours after it starts to go down, it will make this switch over into fat burning. And we get a whole nother actual fuel source. It's called a ketone. And the ketone now actually goes up into the brain, supercharges the brain, gives you more energy, supercharges your mitochondria, and all of a sudden you're now in this limitless hyperspeed sort of feeling. And the only way that the body can make a ketone is by burning fat. So when you stop and you think about that, you're like, wait, okay, when I eat, I'm burning sugar, and when I fast, I'm burning fat fat. And the brain, if we just look at the different body parts, the brain, it requires 50% sugar or what we call glucose and 50% ketones. So if you are never putting yourself in this fat burning state, you and never making ketones, you're depriving your brain of 50% of its fuel source. It's it like the more I talk about it, the more I'm like, why isn't everybody fasting? Why are we not tapping into this fuel source? Because not only can we lose weight and, and stay in the shape we want to stay in, but we can get this byproduct, this ketone that can really supercharge our brain. Rule number two is reset your dopamine. I found some research showing that when people go without food for 48 hours, the whole dopamine system will be rebooted. So what's important to know about the dopamine system is it is our molecule of happiness. It is the thing that it's actually a motivation molecule. And it's a neurotransmitter that allows thoughts, happy thoughts to go across from neuron to neuron. And so what happens, and I'm sure you've talked about this on your podcast, that we're so dopamine saturated right now. Mm -hmm. But specifically people who are overeaters, they actually are finding, the study I quote in the book is that they found that people who had food addiction, people who had extra weight, like obese situations, they were not getting as much happiness out of their food because their dopamine receptor sites were saturated. So they had to eat more food to get more happiness. And, a lot, and you know, food is a state changer. It does make us happy. Mm -hmm. So what they found is if they put them into a 48-hour fast, that they actually rebooted the whole dopamine system and new dopamine receptor sites appeared. So that when they brought food back in to the equation, they actually got more enjoyment out of food with less food. Rule number three is drink lemon water. First reason, first reason you need to be drinking lemon water every single day. I know it's like so obvious, but I wanna explain why it's so important that we apply this first tool or this first reason to our life. And that's because water hydrates us. Now, I can tell you from clinical experience that what I've heard so many people tell me that they know they're supposed to drink water every day, they get that it hydrates them, but they just don't like the taste of water. 
And I have always found that very unusual because I think of water as just neutral. It's just water. I just drink it because I know I'm going to stay hydrated. You need to stay hydrated, by the way, for your skin. You need to stay hydrated for your gut. Your cells are demanding that you hydrate them and bring them water on a daily basis. So if you are finding it very difficult to drink water, what I have noticed is when you put lemon in your water, it perks the brain up and it becomes almost like a dopamine hit. The brain goes, oh, well, this isn't just water, this is lemon. And it has a different response in your brain that creates a dopamine pulse or a dopamine surge. Now, many of you have heard me say this before that when we're looking at our health habits, we don't always need motivation, we need momentum. And I've seen this in people's fasting windows where they are like, oh, they're just dreading every hour that goes by, just waiting to get to that 17th hour or that 24 hour or one of the six fasts that I laid out for you all in Fast Like a Girl. And they're, they're just dragging themselves through that. Well, a little hack is when we put lemon in there, all of a sudden you take a sip and, the, and you get a dopamine hit and all of a sudden that's, your brain is excited. And that creates momentum. And if you do it again an hour later, you're like, I, I've even had some of my patients put lemon water in a wine glass so that you're like, oh, I feel fancy. Like I'm drinking lemon water and it feels like a treat even though I'm in a fasted window. So I love it for tricking the brain into being excited to drink water and keeping that momentum during a fast. Water, lemon water specifically repairs the skin. Okay, now there was a 2016 study that was published in Science Direct, and it talked about when we add lemon to our water, it does several things that are important for the skin. So the first is it increases collagen production. Like, think about that. Where are my menopausal women out there? How much are we fighting for extra collagen? where you know, that wrinkles that's, that's showing up, that's because you're losing collagen as you lose estrogen. And so in order to increase collagen, we gotta pull in as many hacks as possible. And this study in Science Direct showed that it improved co skin collagen production when you drink a daily glass of lemon water. Well, number four is take care of your body. I'm gonna kindly say this, that we can't normalize obesity. We can't. Just because more people are becoming obese, that doesn't mean that that's the path that humans are supposed to go. Now, I will tell what I say is that if you are look in the mirror, you're carrying extra weight, and you love your body, you are, you are not saying mean things to yourself when you look in the mirror, and your blood work shows me that your hemoglobin A1C, your glucose, your insulin, your CRP, all your metabolic markers are okay, then I don't care how much weight you're carrying, but that's not happening. And so we're normalizing obesity. Meanwhile, people are not feeling good in their own skin. And we have this metabolic mess that the world is in that is not only contributing to all of our healthcare expend, you know, increases, but we could take it down to COVID and the immune system. You got to have your metabolic balance in order, in order for your immune system to be up, in order for your brain to function right, in order for you to stay off medications. Metabolic health is at the core of everything we need to do as humans to prevent disease, to stop the acceleration of this chronic disease issue that we've got in our, in our country. So I'm, I'm not a fan of, of normalizing obesity as, and I know that's not like, I want to be compassionate to humans that I'm not saying everybody needs to be a certain number on the scale, but we do have a responsibility to try to be the best version of ourselves metabolically that we can yeah. in order to stay out of, of the disease care system. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific 
plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Rule number five is improve your gut health. What does the research say? Well, really famous study, it was put out, uh, it was done by MIT, so put out by MIT News. And I'll just read the top here, biologists find a way to boost intestinal stem cell populations. And it was done on, on mice, so it's not a human study, but the study suggests that a 24 hour fast will stimulate stem cells and protect the gastrointestinal tract from age related diseases. The 24 hour fast is so powerful for changing the microbiome that it affects everything from cardiovascular disease. We've talked about how it can affect blood pressure. We've talked about how it can really affect uh, weight loss and all of that is because we are making changes to the microbiome. So this is really exciting when we see that we're getting intestinal stem cells. So what are intestinal stem cells? Well, what I want you to remember is that a stem cell is a cell that can go anywhere in the body and create repair. When you are eating all day, you are injuring your mucosal lining of your gut and you're damaging, you're killing good bacteria, you're creating a situation that's like a leaky gut where toxins and undigested food can get into your bloodstream and you are literally destroying that inner mucosal lining, especially if you're eating the standard American diet. Now, if you're not eating the standard American diet, and you're eating good things, you watch my video on what to break a fast with, then you're actually, that part of your gut might be healthy. But when we go 24 hours without food, we reboot those intestinal stem cells, those intestinal stem cells go into this lining and start to repair it so that you can make good neurotransmitters that keep your brain happy, you keep your immune system strong. Um, gosh, everything in there, serotonin, dopamine, all those yummy hormones that we want, the breaking down of estrogen that so many menop menopausal women need. This is all enhanced with a 24 hour fast and a reboot of your digestive system. Now, what if you actually have a gut problem? You're not just looking for the side, secondary side effects of, uh, of a 24 hour fast. You're like, I legit have like gut dysbiosis, leaky gut, candida, parasites, SIBO. Can a fast like this help? And my response to you is not only can it help, I actually do not think you will get very far in the overcoming those conditions without the use of the 24 hour fast. So for something like SIBO, now SIBO is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and it is when you get the bacteria in the wrong part of your intestine. It's in the small intestine, not the large intestine. They meander up into that small intestine and you know you have SIBO because when you eat vegetables, your stomach gets really bloated. That's a classic example of SIBO. So when you use it for things like SIBO, where you're throwing these 24 hour fasts at you, all of a sudden you may start to notice over time, you can eat vegetables and you're not having that reaction. What about something like candida, where you have like crazy cravings for sugar? Well, let me tell you, and my friend Jesse Itzler is a great example of this. If you've not followed Jesse on Instagram, go follow him. He is starting his fasting journey and we are having so much fun working together and seeing changes that he's making in his body. And one of the things he said to me was, my cravings have changed. Why have my cravings changed? It's because he's doing 24 hour fasts and it's changing the microbiome and allowing the good bacteria to grow and the bad bacteria to go away. So bad fungus, like things like candida are dying off and he's not craving the carbs that he used to crave. Well, we all have seen that. I used to crave chocolate all the time. Don't crave it anymore the more I'm throwing these longer fasts. Because when you change the microbiome through fasting, you change your cravings. Rule number six is control your sugar intake. What do you think our relationship should be with sugar? Hmm. Well, you know, there's only 12% of Americans that are metabolically healthy. That's, that means that 
they have the right blood pressure, the right cholesterol, that their hemoglobin A1C, their insulin, all those metabolic markers are in balance. Only 12% of Americans have that right. That is a huge problem. And that is largely because we're addicted to sugar. So what's the consequence of poor metabolic health? Obesity, cancer, heart disease, mental health challenges, I mean, you name it, every chronic disease on the planet at the root has a metabolic thread. Now, I hate to, to bring back a, 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 a really traumatic concept, uh, topic, but w- during COVID, when we looked at the people that fell prey to COVID, this is no, no disrespect, they were metabolically unhealthy. And the people that had less COVID sim- symptoms were the ones that were more metabolically healthy in general. So, and largely because the virus could, gr- could really replicate if you had a lot of glucose in your system. So the consequence is huge. And the healthcare consequence, the amount of money we pay trying to help everybody put their health back together because they're metabolically unhealthy. If we just started with metabolic health, we would change everything. And, you know, we can look at different things like hemoglobin A1C. It's a marker in the blood. Everybody gets it tested every year when they go to their doctor. It should be under five. If it's not under five, what's happening is all that extra sugar is is going around your red blood cells and your red blood cells carry oxygen to your body. So they're gummed up with sugar so they can't deliver things, oxygen to the brain, to your eyes, to your muscle. So you're not getting oxygenated because of the sugar just gumming up these red blood cells. Rule number seven is eat healthy. Diabetes to me is just a fancy term for insulin resistance, okay? What is insulin resistant? Insulin resistance is just a fancy term for your body has made too much insulin and it doesn't know what to do with it. So every time you've been eating, the pancreas has been pushing out all this insulin, trying to connect it to the glucose that you're eating so that it can drive it into the cell. And you just did that too many times, so the pancreas is wearing out, the cells are starting to be oversaturated with insulin, they don't know what to do. And so you have all this extra insulin that often gets stored as fat. So that's a mechanism of what, of the basis of what diabetes is. Okay, the first one for my meat eaters is a grass-fed steak. And it can be a burger, it can be grass-fed meat in general. In fact, I've even gotten recently into organ meats. I think organ meats are phenomenal. Um, We were at a restaurant in New York recently where there was a burger with organ meats mixed into it, so you couldn't even taste it, and you got we got all of the benefit of organ meat. So how does grass-fed meat tie into diabetes? Well, and and why do I say grass-fed? That's the other thing I want to point out. So what we know about meat is that it is a protein. Protein will stabilize your blood sugar. But grass-fed meats come with a little extra healthy punt because they're going to give you omega-3 fatty acids. And omega-3 fatty acids create this beautiful health to the outer membrane of your cells. So stick with me here because think about this. So diabetes is the cells not responding to insulin and glucose. Grass-fed meats have omega-3 fatty acids in it, which nourish this bilipid membrane around the outside of those cells so that it can start to bring the health of the cellular membrane back again, allowing insulin to be more effective inside the cell and get into the cell. So that's why I say not conventional meats, I'm saying grass-fed meats because of the omega-3 capability to repair that that cellular membrane that's happening with the damage that happens with diabetes. Okay, number two, this one you all love. I did a big video on it, and that is egg. Why do I love eggs so much? So remember, everything inside that egg is actually has all the, the nutritional makeup to build and grow a baby chick. It has all those nutrients in it. So when you're eating an egg, you're not only getting protein that will stabilize your blood sugar, great for diabetics, but you're also getting all these extra nutrients in there that are going to help support cartilage. They're gonna help to power up your mitochondria. They're gonna help to build your brain stronger. And one of the things 
things we know about diabetes is that when you have too much sugar in your system, it gums up your red blood cells. I've talked about this before. I've, I've talked with Net Boz about this and another fellow YouTuber um, and how we need to bring back the health of the red blood cells so it can oxygenate the whole, your whole, all the cells in your body. So eggs, what eggs do is they start to go into the areas like your brain and bring nourishment to the brain because it may not be getting the nourishment it needs. It may not be getting the oxygen that it needs because your red blood cells are so gummed up with extra glucose. Okay, number three. This is my favorite. Spoke about this a lot and it is the avocado. So with the avocado, you have so many qualities to an avocado that will help a diabetic body. For starters, it's really high in fat, so it'll stabilize your blood sugar. In fact, I will tell you a little hack I use for myself is I have an avocado with every meal because I know it's gonna stabilize my blood sugar. The other thing is about an avocado is it's high in fiber. So it not only stabilizes blood sugar, but in many cases, it'll bring blood sugar down. For diabetics, this is really important because now you may not need as much insulin, exogenous insulin into your system. So put it with every single meal to stabilize your blood sugar. Okay, number four. Now, this is a good one. I feel like we haven't talked about this. So I want you to hear this all the way through. And it is bitter foods. So I want to give sort of a category and I'm specifically talking about bitter vegetables. My favorites are dandelion greens and radicchio. And the reason if you're diabetic, you're going to want to support your liver is because the liver is a fat burning organ. It is detoxing you. It is stabilizing blood sugar. It is helping you make low amounts of ketones. It's really, really important. So make sure that you bring in some of these bitter vegetables and make and so that you can feed your liver so it can balance your blood sugar better. Rule number eight is shift your thinking. As a culture, we have to just stop for a moment and say the goal is not to all look, you know, fit into our skinny jeans. That's not the goal. But the goal is to be metabolically healthy. And I don't know, I think genetically, we all, our metabolic health will have a different number on the scale. Right. Um, and so we we got to get away from the scale, which is why I love glucose monitors and I love lab work, yearly lab work. Like hemoglobin A1C is a phenomenal thing to look at on a yearly basis. If your hemoglobin A1C is over five, what that means is your red blood cells are gooked up with glucose molecules, like gum on the outside of, of that red blood cell. And what that red blood cell's purpose is doing to your whole body is it's delivering oxygen to your brain, to your, to your organs, to every part of your body. So if it's gummed up with glucose and sugar, that's the, a process called glycation, then it can't get oxygen to certain parts of your body, which means those parts are going to start to decay. So if we just took hemoglobin A1C and used that as our measurement of, of health, we would totally change the direction that humans are going. But instead, we're, we're using the scale, we're, we're normalizing higher numbers. I mean, I can even say when I go into stores to buy clothes now, the, you know, the, the, the size I used to be actually now is completely different because all of the clothes is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And we're changing just the size alone to fit this obesity issue that's happening. And it, it's at so many levels, we need to shake this up and come back to some normalcy around metabolic health. Rule number nine is maintain a balanced diet. Now eating, yeah. men and women eating. Yeah. So men, um, I think as far as food, I agree with just keeping blood sugar stable is great. I think you guys really work well off of a meat based and animal uh, diet. I don't think you have more, you have more testosterone, which means you have more muscle. We, the way that we build muscle and keep muscle strong is through amino acids and you get that in meat. So for men, I feel like that primal diet, the paleo diet was meat and vegetables and fruit is amazing. I think that's that's perfect. I don't think refined flours and sugars um, that we get, are exposed to, I think that over in an, an overabundance, they'll hurt men too. And we're seeing that with metabolic syndrome. Women, we do well with meats. I, you know, um, I think we need less of it because we have less testosterone. 
So we may need less of it, although it is important. Protein is important, especially as we age. So I don't want to lose sight on that. Um, but we also need to bring glucose up. So we need more fruits. We're going to need more squashes. We're going to need more potatoes. And that's, you know, all built around your menstrual cycle. And so, eating times? Uh, I'm, I'm not a fan of eating when it's dark out because when mel melatonin goes up, insulin, you become more insulin resistant. So I'm a fan of- Which means what? It means you, you so your, your body won't process the glucose okay. from that meal as efficiently when it's dark out. It won't take it away and store yeah. it where it needs to be stored yeah. as energy. Exactly. It will store it as fat or something? Or uh, it yeah, it's going to store it as fat. If, it can't, if insulin can't drive it into the cell for inner energy, it'll store it as fat. So the meal you eat at 9.30 is going to be stored more as fat than if you have that same meal at 5.30. And rule number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips is exercise. I hope if there's any personal trainers that are listening to this, like you, you nailed it. The, instead of putting women on this weekly cycle of working out, we should put women on their menstrual cycle. Are they 28 days, 30 days, 32? I mean, every, every woman's different, but this, the easiest way to understand this is that when estrogen is coming in, those power phases, when those power phases show up, yeah, push the workout, do the hit training, do the plyometrics, do really go into a deeper um, acceleration with your fitness. Your bot, your hormones can handle it. When testosterone comes in, could we take that five days and maybe one day you lift really, really heavy weights that for your biceps and triceps and the next day you do really heavy weights and, and really push your glutes and your hamstrings and your quads. And then the next day you do abs, like take five days and really power up your strength because you've got testosterone that will help you build muscle. But then to your point, when we move into that nurture phase in the back half, that's where yoga, Pilates, go for a hike, go for a walk. That's your recovery time of all things. Can we bring that fitness aggression or that enthusiasm might be a little bit better? Can we bring it down to a more soft, softer level so the, the, the female body can recover? Throughout the day, there's a couple of things you need to keep your energy up for the next day. Not necessarily energy in that day. Well, there are a few. I'll tell you about that. But how do you always live today knowing that the, the health habits you do today are going to affect tomorrow's energy levels? So think about that. So whenever I get stressed, I move. I, I, I go for a walk. I walk sometimes 10 times a day. If I'm at my desk, something stresses me, I don't sit there. I get up and I move and I use that cortisol. So that that's a biggie. The second thing I do is I make sure I get out and I see the midday light because we have serotonin receptor sites in our eyes and I want little doses of serotonin throughout the day. So I'll let those receptor sites get nourished with light so that my body knows where it is in my circadian rhythm and it's keeping itself in a, in a good pace. When I, when I open up my eating window, I'm always working to stabilize my blood sugar. So every few months, I put on a continuous glucose monitor so I can understand how my, glu my blood sugar is doing and do I need to pair and put my macros together differently. So throughout the day, what you do in a day really matters, not only for your energy that day, but the energy tomorrow. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end, and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video. I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. For 10 more amazing rules from Andrew Huberman, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. The key to getting out of that pain trough is one of two things. You can just wait you can wait till your motivation comes back. And a lot of people do wait. In fact, they procrastinate as a replacement for doing the very thing that they quote unquote need to do or ought to do.